Um, we're going to do ball bearings today. Roller contact bearings, ball bearings in particular. Um, next time we'll do journals, so uh, without the rolling elements. But I didn't have a, a reasonable size uh, ball bearing, so I printed one just to give us the big idea of what's going on with here. These things, you know, they're made to reduce friction so that uh, usually a shaft can rotate uh, at a high RPM and not wear down immediately, you know. So um, they have three big components and then there's lots of other little components that this one I printed doesn't have on it. Um, but uh, they have what's called an inner race. So this part inside here, this is the inner race. Um, they have an outer race, so obviously the one on the outside. So these are the um, surfaces that the rolling element, in this case the balls, um, actually contact. Um, these rolling elements could be spherical, like in here, that's a ball bearing. Um, they could be cone-shaped, they could be cylindrical, they could look like little needles. There's all kinds of different shapes for the actual element that does the rolling around in a rolling contact bearing. But... Um, your book, chapter, this is all chapter 11 in Shigley. Um, it has some kind of decent pictures of cross sections. Um, they, you might take some interpreting to figure out what they're actually showing you. Um, it would probably do better to go and, you know, grab some pictures off of Google or whatever of, of these things and see what they look like. Um, maybe I can print some more uh, different styles. But this is the general thing that most people think of when you think of uh, a roller bearing is a ball bearing. Now, you know, they come in all different sizes. I didn't have one large enough that uh, you could see anything from. But uh, this is the typical ball bearing, inner race, outer race, and balls, cylinders, cones, tapered cone, you know, whatever uh, as the element. This one has spheres. Um, other things that might be included on here, there might be a retainer that keeps these elements kind of spaced out, you know, so they don't all uh, clump around. You know, this one, you can see it's got some slack in it. You know, this one's 3D printed, so it's got extra slack that uh, one that uh, probably is, doesn't normally have that much slack. But they do have to have some slack in there. And so there might be a little retainer that keeps these rolling elements evenly spaced. Uh, there might be covers, like little seals to keep dirt and grit out of there because obviously anything gritty inside here and this spinning around 2,000 RPMs or whatever it's doing um, is going to wear this down very quickly. Speaking of wear, um, when you have contact, you know, like these, these bearing, uh, ball bearings contacting the races, um, you don't have infinite life. Eventually it will wear down just from the uh, contact in fatigue. You know, you're constantly pushing on one of these surfaces, the ball, whatever it is. Um, you, it will wear out, so these do have a planned replacement period. That's one of the first things that you have to do is figure out how long do you want to um, wait until you go in and replace the bearing. Um, so that's one of the first things we'll do. We'll work a problem here in a second. Um, there might be other, some of, these, uh, some of these ball bearings have the ability to articulate a little bit, so maybe, maybe the outer race is, is held in some fixture and the inner race now this one doesn't really have it but it has some ability to you know articulate this way you know this way kind of like that um these particular one that i printed doesn't really have that but um there there are some that self-align within reason um and maybe you remember when we were talking about shafts there were uh there was the need to go in and calculate the deflection at different points um, because if that deflection is too high, then you'll, you'll end up with too much misalignment between wherever this thing fits and the shaft and whatever's on the other end of it, and you can prematurely wear these things out because you do want uh, the bearings to not have to deal with too many stresses that they aren't designed for. Um, these typically, obviously, are going to handle a radial load, but they can handle... Um, a little bit of a thrust load. Now, some bearings are more particularly designed to handle a thrust load axial. So, you know, if there's a load going this direction, um, thrust load, axial load might be another word for it. Um, 
these bearings can handle some of that. The one that we'll work on today uh, will do two bearings, one that doesn't need to carry a thrust load and one that does carry a thrust load. Uh, and we'll look at that <coughs> later on. Um, let's, let's draw up a picture of what we're going to work on. We're going to work on um, a helical gear. Now, the gear we're going to do gears in a week or two, um, so we don't really need to know too much about the gear itself. But uh, we're going to have a shaft. Let's try and draw something like that. Um, let's put a helical gear on here. Now, helical means that instead of uh, a spur gear with the, the gear teeth coming off, you know, perpendicular, um, these still come off perpendicular, but they're at an angle. So I'm going to try and draw them at an angle. And what this will do, now I think I'm drawing them backwards from the angle I actually want, but that's okay. Um, what these angled gear teeth are going to do is not only you know transmit a torque but they're going to induce a thrust load so that we'll have to deal with one of these bearings having to handle a thrust load um, and then here's the other side of the shaft um, our bearings are going to be you know one of them let's do them a different color one bearing will be on one end so we'll put a bearing down here these will be uh, just like this kind that's maybe that's why I'm doing them red I guess I didn't even think about that but um, ball bearing on one end and a ball bearing on the other end and again you can have all kinds of different bearings and the ball bearings are probably the most common <clears throat> so we have bearings on both ends they do not have to be the same a lot of times they are the same because um, just for design for manufacture type purposes um, if I have uh, a particular bearing here and use the exact same bearing over here, then I only have to have one kind of bearing in stock. Usually that means one of them is over designed. Um, you know, I'm, I'm maybe paying a little bit more uh, for one of these bearings than I need to be, but a lot of times it's simpler in the bigger picture just to have the same bearing on both uh, ends or wherever they might be. Um, we'll go in and that's uh, we'll go in and design one of these bearings. Now, design. We'll select uh, one of the bearings from a list of you know possible bearings. Your book in chapter 11 has a couple of charts that have typical bearing type numbers um, that you might see from a manufacturer, and uh, we'll go in and select the ones that are going to work for us. Um, and we'll end up selecting two different ones, and then we'll discuss whether or not maybe we should keep. Um, them different or just make the one that doesn't have to be quite so beefy make it larger just so that we have the same kind of bearing um, let's put some dimensions on here let's see how can we do this we'll do it this way we're going to put this at um, now actually I put these in US units but um, your bearing charts are all in the book, are all in metric units. So um, we will have to deal with that, but that's okay. <clears throat> they obviously do make U.S. unit bearing charts out there, just your book doesn't have any. Um, so this helical gear, it's connected to some other gear somewhere meshed with it, um, and it creates three forces that we have to worry about. Um, one of those forces is a radial force. I'm going to show it kind of like this. So one that, you know, points to the radius of the gear. Um, we'll just call that W with an R on it. And I had that at 17 pounds. Again, we'll have to convert that. Um, it creates a tangential force because it has to turn the gear. So I'm going to draw that one kind of this way. I had that one at, um, actually, no, I didn't have that at 17 pounds. I had it at 34 pounds. Oh, let's fix that. And I had the tangential force at 80.8 pounds. And then uh, there is that axial well not axial uh, axial to the shaft I guess so the thrust load or the axial load 
and it's going to go this way. We're going to we're going to make it put a thrust load on bearing A over here. Must be bearing B. Um, and I had that as W A, and I had it at uh, 46.6 pounds. We kind of got small there, but that's okay. We just need something to look at. Um, so one of the things we need to be able to do is, like I said, these bearings will wear out um, and we need a planned replacement uh, for them. And so what we're going to do with these is we're going to say that um, they are running you know, 24-7. They, they never turn off. Um, and they're going 1,800, or the shaft is spinning 1,800 RPM. And uh, we want to replace them, I believe I said every, I mean, let me look real quick before I have to undo it later. Um, I have them going every five years. So every five years you have to go in and replace these things. Now, um, maybe you might have something that every two months you have to go and replace it or every six months or twice, you know, well, I guess twice a year is six months. But, um, you know, you've got some time where um, you want these things to run without you going in and replace them. So I picked five years at 1800 RPM. Um, let's see, do we need any other bits of information yet? Um, oh, yeah, one other thing. We need to know how big this gear is in diameter. Um, so I have it as a 8-inch diameter. Uh, we need that to be able to calculate the torque um, that this tangential force creates about the axis here. Um, and the moment that, maybe more importantly, because we we're not really worried about the torque transfer in this problem. Obviously, you would be in the design of this bearing and shaft and gear, but um, we're more interested in just the bearings themselves right now. So what we're going to need to do is figure out uh, this ten this axial or thrust load is actually going to create a bending moment in here that we have to account for. Um, back to this though, we need to figure out uh, bearings. When you go to select a bearing, um, you have to go in and look in a catalog somewhere. And these catalogs have a uh, load rating or a catalog rating you might hear it called um, you might hear a dynamic dynamic load capacity all these different terms um, but they're all based on the manufacturer going in and testing uh, sets of their bearings to failure failure means different things doesn't necessarily mean um, some kind of catastrophic it exploded kind of failure but there have uh, have enough failure in the usually it's pitting in the uh, bearing itself and that constitutes failure so um, anyway they've they've gone and tested samples of their bearings at certain you know maybe a million rpms uh, not in rpms a million cycles um, or 90 million cycles and so they go in and try to figure out um, this catalog rating and we need to convert the number of cycles we want our bearing to last over to their standards uh, and your book um, talks about manufacturer one and manufacturer two. So you'll see the reference to manufacturer one and manufacturer two. Um, all, the difference there is that um, one of these manufacturers uh, rates their bearings at 90 million cycles. You can see this easiest in the very back of the chapter. So if we go all the way to the end, there's one of those uh, catalog sections. But if we go all the way to the end of the chapter, there's a little table that talks about manufacturer one and manufacturer two. Um, and you can see rating life revolutions. One of them is at 90 million and one of them is at 1 million. And you get these parameters, these Babel or Weibull parameters uh, that are going to go into some of our equations. And manufacturer one and two kind of represent two of the bigger um, manufacturers out there uh, for bearings. And that, that they use different systems for this number that you're going to use so we got to figure out how many cycles is this so that's that's one of the first things that we're going to need to do let's let's do that in mathcad um let me bring up mathcad so that we can look at it 
and we want to go for um, oh I wrote down 1800 is 2800 rpm let me fix that so just fix that now rpm is 2800 revolutions per minute uh, let's call it speed equals 2800 rpm um, I'm just gonna write that the units get kind of weird on doing this particular thing to get to cycles so I'm just gonna write it out as um, L D. So this is the desired desired life, design life, um, the number of cycles that I want my bearing to undergo before I have to replace it. Um, and I'm just gonna write it as a symbolic equation and then we'll calculate it out. So I want it to last for 2,800 revolutions per minute. That's the RPM. <clears throat> and then I know that there are 60 minutes per hour. So that's one of my conversion factors. Um, I know that there are 24 hours per day. Some of these units aren't programmed into MathCAD to, to handle this the way I want it to, so that's why I'm writing it out like this. Um, I know that there are 365.25 if you get you know really technical with the leap years and everything. So 365.25 days per year. Whoops, not dat, day, days per year. And I know I want it to be run for five years. So if I do this math, I will get the number of cycles that I want this bearing to last. So let's actually just put the numbers in. 2800 times 60 times 24, 365.25 times five equals so a whole lot of cycles. Um, let's put it in decimal form. Look at all that. That's how many cycles I want this bearing, or b both of these bearings, to last before I have to go in and replace it. But I am, you know, I don't want to replace it except every five years. So that's kind of a longer term. I did that so that our numbers um, land where I want them to later on in the problem. But um, that's, that's one thing. Um, you have this term that we just looked at called the rated life and that's the number either um, from manufacturer one with 90 million or manufacturer two with 1 million so we're going to use the 1 million and from these two terms we get our one of our first variables that we're going to use um, and this this uh, design life ratio oops that should be a d so it, and it's literally just the ratio of these two numbers so how many, basically how many times more do you want to deal with, um, let's put it in decimal form. Hmm, is that the one that I wanted? Yeah, that's what I want. All right, um, so many times more than what's in the catalog basically. Um, the catalog is showing all the numbers related to their bearings at 1 million cycles and I want, you know, seven trillion cycles or whatever this is billion cycles I guess all right um, so that's an easy one we can get that one pretty easy right off the bat um, now you here you've got to look in your book at two different equations um, 11 3 is one of them right here let's get math cat out of the way so equation 11 3 this LD over LR that is the variable we just looked at um, FD, that's the force, the design force that we want to deal with. Um, we haven't calculated that yet. We've kind of looked at it, uh, but we haven't actually figured it out yet. We've got it broken into three little components. And um, A is a term that's on the other page, page uh, 566. There's, it's not even in the equation. It's under equation 11.1, but there's these two different values for A. Um, one for ball bearings, which is what we're going to use and a different number for A for roller bearings that aren't spherical. So maybe cones or cylinders or some whatever. Um, and so this has to do with the contact patch that would be different if the element is more like a cylinder versus a sphere. So a sphere kind of makes a circular contact patch on inside the bearing um, where the ball touches the race, whereas a cylindrical one would make more of a rectangular contact patch between the 
cylindrical rolling element and the race of the bearing. And so they're using these two different numbers, three and 10 thirds. So they're not drastically different, but they are different. Um, and they end up in an exponent over here. Um, now this equation um, you could use. Um, we're not gonna use this one. This one is assuming that you want 90% reliability and it doesn't include an, what's called an application factor. So that's sort of like a factor of safety. Um, so if you want 90% reliability with no um, application factor on top of it, yes, you can use this equation. We're actually gonna use this equation over here. Um, right, there's several versions of it over here. We're gonna use this last one down here. Um, and you notice this R greater than 0.9, that's saying that I want a reliability more than 90%. I want 95, I think I put 97 in R's maybe. I don't remember what I put, we'll have to dig it out in a second. Yeah, 97. Um, so it creates this denominator that we didn't have before. You don't see the LR and LD, but they are in XD right here. So that is that ratio of LR or LD over LR that we just calculated in MathCAD. Um, and this AF, that's the application factor. Um, your book does have a little chart of application factors. They typically are a little greater than one to maybe a little less than two, somewhere in that range. Um, I think we're gonna use 1.3 or something. I don't remember, 1.4 is what we're, we'll use. Um, so that's kind of like a factor of safety. Notice this is an approximation. Um, you have an exact one up here with a natural log in it. Um, and you've got all these little X naught and theta and B. Those terms are all the Weibull or Babel, depending on how you want to pronounce it, uh, parameters. That's a statistical approach. Bearings um, are governed, at least in the catalogs, by uh, statistical failures. And um, these are the parameters that describe that distribution. You know, it's not a, just a typical normal distribution. Those parameters, X naught, theta, and B, that are in this denominator, you get from that chart that showed manufacturer one and two that's at the end of the book. So you have to know, are you dealing with, not the end of the book, end of the chapter, um, are you dealing with uh, manufacturer one or manufacturer two? So the problem has to tell you or which one are you dealing with as far as these two manufacturers in the book anyway. Um, in a uh, catalog, you know, you would be given what rating life they are using. Um, and usually they're gonna be either 90 million or 1 million. <clears throat> so we're using manufacturer two, so we would pick up this X naught at 0 0.02, theta at 4.4, this is not an angle, it's just a parameter, 4.459, uh, and then B at 1.483. So we would pick those three off. In fact, why don't we go ahead and do that since we know that we're gonna use those. Let's put those in MathCAD. So we're gonna have X not at uh, 0 0.02, we're gonna have theta at uh, 4.459, and we'll have B at, B at um, 1.483. Um, let's go ahead and define our application factor. Again, this is like the factor of safety. We're gonna do 1.4, um, and then A, remember that's the little, exponent that determines if uh, you are, that tells if you're using uh, ball bearings or cylindrical type bearings. We're using ball bearings, so we'll have a three in there. So all of these are just um, parameters that we need to decide. There's one other that we'll get to later, but uh, we, aren't, we aren't to it yet. All right, what we need to do now is we need to work on this term, FD. Uh, so the design load that we're gonna worry with that was interesting. Um, so how do we deal with the FD? That is the design load on the bearing itself. Um, let's draw a free body diagram of our uh, shaft, bearing, gear, but let's draw it from the side uh, as we're looking this direction. So something like this. There's our gear. Um, we've got bearing A over here, bearing B over here. Now on the 
from this view, view anyway, again, I'm looking kind of down this direction. I've got, uh, <clears throat> I can see the WR, the radial force, that was 34 pounds. I can see uh, the axial or the thrust load. I'm going to draw it this way, even though the gear teeth make it look like it's probably going another way, but we're going to draw it this way. Um, I have that at 46 point uh, six pounds and then I've got you know some kind of reaction at a in the I'm gonna call that the y direction and then this will be the reaction at B in the y direction and we'll also have to do this looking down from the top uh, and combine everything together um, and I also have I'm gonna make react uh, bearing a here I'm gonna make it carry the thrust load so we'll call that um, I don't remember what I called it actually, but we'll call it uh, axial. We'll call it FA. So it's the force, but it's the axial. I'll put an axial so that we know that's what we're talking about. Um, so that load, I kind of drew it on the shaft, but that's actually on the bearing. Um, and so this bearing is going to have um, an extra load that uh, bearing B over here won't have. So it, ha it has to react that. Uh, 46 pounds um, and at this point it just becomes a beam equation where you do you know find these two unknowns um, now I do want to do one thing though to make it simpler um, notice how I've got the 46.6 pounds up here um, so this is kind of assuming that the gear that's uh, meshed with this one is sitting up here somewhere which is fine. Um, that's nothing wrong with the gear being up there, but I don't uh, like that this 46.6 pounds is up here and then the reaction to it is down here. You know, there's some distance between there. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna take this 46.6 pounds and I'm gonna put it here. But when I move it down, then I have to also include the fact that you know, pushing pushing up here at the top of this gear does want to create a, a moment that I have to take into account. So when I move the force down so that these better align and I can just add them together, then um, now I suddenly have to take into account this moment. This moment magnitude will be the 46.6 pounds uh, and it will have a moment arm of the radius of the gear. Um, I said that the gear had an 8 inch diameter, so it has a 4 inch radius, so I need to multiply that times 4 inches. So now I don't use this one, so this is kind of, you know, I can't erase it because I wrote it in ink, but so I don't use that one, but now I use these two. So you can kind of see right off the bat that the axial force is just equal to 46.6 pounds. And then um, you can do summation of moments about one of these gear or one of these bearings and get the reaction at the other bearing and so forth. Um, so I'm pretty sure you can do that. I don't think we need to work through that part. Um, but it ends up R A Y equals. Let's see, I had that written down. 100 and oh, I have it in newtons though. Um, 146.02 newtons. Why don't we do this in MathCAD um, and that way our units will all make more sense. <clears throat> All right, so here we're back in MathCAD. Um, we've got uh, WT, so that's the tangential force. We're, we don't, we're actually not looking at it just yet, but I'm going to go ahead and write it in. I had that one at 80.8 um, .8 pounds, um, but we want that in Newtons. And we had um, WR, that's the force that points towards the center of the sh gear in the shaft. Um, I had that one at 34 pounds, and there it is in Newtons. And then we had WA, well, not capital, WA, which is the thrust load or the axial load, and I had that at uh, 46.6 pounds, and there it is in Newtons. Okay, um, so the force A, the one that's the axial force 
or the thrust load carried by bearing A, that just equals this guy, the axial force generated by the gear. Um, normally you don't have both bearings carrying a thrust load. It is possible. Um, we don't want that in this case um, because it would, they would kind of act against each other. Uh, so normally there's one bearing that's going to carry the thrust load. Um, and that's bearing A in our case. All right, um, now let's work on writing our um, moment equation um, to figure out the reaction at BY. So look at this. Basically, I'm going to do summation of moments about A is 34 pounds times this distance was 6 inches. Again, our units are going to have to be worked out. MathCAD will do that for us. This is 9 inches. There we go. So um, 34, I'm doing moments about A, 34 pounds times 6 inches. Um, that's a clockwise moment. This is counterclockwise, so I have to sub subtract off the 46.6 times 4 inch pounds. Um, and then divide by 15 inches to get to the reaction at B. So we'll write that in math cap. So that will give us the reaction at B in the Y direction. So it's only one component of the reaction at B. Um, and it is... WR times um, the six inches. MathCAD will handle my units. If you're doing this by hand, you had to be careful with these units uh, because I'm mixing newtons and inches and all that's not going to work out nice for you if you're doing it by hand without converting things. Here's that WA times R that R. Well, I need to define what R is. R is the radius of the gear, which is four inches. And again, MathCAD will handle my inches, uh, converting over to meters. Um, and then divide by 15 inches. All right, so I've got five newtons as the Y component of the reaction at B. And then reaction at A in the Y direction. Uh, I just need to do, um, maybe let's look at the picture, free body diagram. Uh, I've got 34 newtons pushing down. RA pushing up, RB pushing up. So if I just do 34 minus RB, I'll figure out what AY is. So um, 34, I don't want to put 34. I want to put the variable name, which is WR minus the one we just calculated, RBY, gives us RA, way higher than um, RB. So already we're looking, not only does um, the bearing at A have to count carry a thrust load, but it has, at least in the y, y direction, a much higher um, force that it has to react. So it's looking like RA is going to be the one that we have to deal with. We'll do RB first, just because it's simpler, then we'll do RA. Um, we have to also look at this thing from overhead. So this free body diagram is looking from this direction. Now I need to look from this direction and see what's going on there. So if I look at a free body diagram of that, it'll look something like, this picture will look very similar, actually identical, because it's all, all the elements are round, so it doesn't matter if you look at the front or the top, they look the same. Um, and we still have our six inches and nine inches. Um, but the forces are different. So here I'm going to be looking at um, this will be the reaction at A in the Z direction. And this will be the reaction at B in the Z direction. So what my plan is, is I will figure out the reactions in the Y direction, the reactions in the Z direction, and combine those together to get the reaction at A. And that's the force that I need to design for. Um, so from here, looking at the top, um, I can't really uh, see this. I see the, uh, the uh, ten or well, I call it tangential, yes, um, the tangential force. I see that one. And um, it's going to, let's see if I'm looking, I guess it's pointing, well, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, the way I drew it here, 
and the way these arrows, they all go the same direction. So obviously some of these arrows should be pointing the other direction or else this little piece is flying off the page here, which I don't want it to do. So that just means that I drew these A and B reactions in the wrong direction, but that's okay. Um, and this is 80.8 pounds. Um, and I can see WA, it's no different. I don't even need to solve for it again. It's the same thing it was in the first diagram, except I called this F axial, I guess. All right. Um, we do a similar thing where we did over here, except we don't, we don't need this. We don't need to worry with the moment that's created by having the force of, you know, trying to twist the gear around. We don't have to worry with that. Um, this force is actually trying to spin the gear. So if I wanted to know the torque that was being transmitted, then I would take this 80 pounds multiplied times the radius, and that would be uh, the torque that's being transmitted. But the torque doesn't have uh, any bearing on, well, that's a bad choice of words. The torque doesn't have any uh, influence on the bearing failure. It's the number of cycles and how hard are the bearings having to react uh, you know, axial or well, radially and axially in this case for bearing A. <clears throat> so I just do moments about A again and I'll figure out what B, Z is and then I can do summation of forces in the Y direction or well, Z direction. All right, so let's write that in. Um, R dot A, Y, you know, this is moments, actually, let's do, uh, not that, let's do B, Z. We already did ay all right bz um rx it doesn't matter i was assuming that x is the axial direction so whichever whichever one you want to use um bz would be um the wt times uh, it has a moment arm of six inches and then we just divide that by 15 inches and we get this uh, 143 Newton force. And then we need a reaction at A. And again, um, according to my picture, I've drawn the arrow the wrong way. That doesn't matter for what we're doing. Uh, we can just flip the arrow around the other direction correctly. Um, we need the tangential force minus the reaction at B, and that'll give us the reaction at A. So again, um, these are both larger numbers um, but A carries the larger one again. So it looks like the bearing at A is going to be our uh, one to design for. We're going to go through and design both of them, though. So here is the total reaction at A, and all you do is the uh, square root of the summation of the squares. Let's do, I did um, Y and Z, didn't I? So AY squared plus a z squared so this is the total force this would be f d in our equation when we get back to it for bearing a and then we need one for bearing b also we just put b's in here and like we suspected it's a good bit lower um, now, I'm going to do B first because B does not have to carry the thrust load. So the, the thrust load generated by this helical gear um, is only carried by A the way that we want to arrange it. Um, so bearing B, all we have to consider is that radial load that we just calculated. So all we have to consider is this guy. <clears throat> so let's look at our equation and see what all we need to put in it. All right, so we're, we're doing equation 1110, um, and we're trying to calculate this thing called C10, which is the design life rating or the catalog rating. Um, basically, this number is um, in the catalog, when you look up a number for C10, it's gonna be some number of kilonewtons or pounds. Um, and what that is, is under that many pounds or kilonewtons, 10% of the bearings fail before a million cycles. 90% of them last more than a million cycles. 
um, or 90 million, you know, whichever your manufacturer you're dealing with. So that's, that's the idea of what this uh, C10 is going to give us. So AF, we're going to, we already picked our application factor. Uh, we plugged it in and it was 1.4. So that's a higher than, you know, they might normally be, but it's one of the uh, ways that you can, on top of your um, reliability, add a factor of safety. Um, FD, that's the force that the bearings having to be designed to carry. So that's the number that we just calculated. Um, there's all our weighable parameters. Um, XD, that was that design life ratio um, that we calculated at the very beginning. Uh, we want our bearing to last like 7 billion cycles or whatever it was. Um, and the ones in our book are only shown for 1 million cycles. So this is the ratio of what we want compared to what's in the book. And so we have a big number there. Um, a is the um, fact that we're using a roller bearing, or well, a spherical roller bearing and not a cylindrical roller bearing. So we have a three there. And this RD, that is our desired reliability. Our, we haven't talked about that yet, but um, we're gonna go for 97% reliability. So we want this thing to last for five years, 97% sure it's gonna last. Um, carry all this load um, and then we'll replace it after that. So this equation should help us figure that out. If you would wanted just the 90% then equation 11.3 uh, basically doesn't have this denominator in it. So let's code this thing into MathCAD and see what it tells us. Um, we've got, no we don't have math. There's MathCAD. Alright, so C10 for bearing B. It's gonna equal, all right, I gotta get all this right. Our application factor times FD, which is, uh, we'll have to code that in a second, times um, XD, the design life ratio. I don't know if we put that one in or not. Yeah, we did, right there. I called it a capital X though, it looks like. So let's, let's actually change this one to a lowercase x because there's a capital X later on that might get confusing. All right, yeah. Um, XD, all of that is divided by um, X naught, the weighable parameter. Ours is 0 0.02 plus uh, theta minus X naught times um, one minus rd we haven't plugged that in yet that's our 97 percent reliability that part is raised to the one over b and all of this part is raised to the one over a all right now we haven't put all these numbers in so it's going to complain at us but fd the design load that we want this to carry for now we're doing bearing b because it's going to be simpler so it's going to be big B. RD, that's the reliability we want. We want 97%, so I'm going to put well, 0 0.97. Um, I guess I already put A and B in. Let's see. There's B, there's A, they look right. Now, out of this should come a force unit. Um, well, it's heading, or Newtons, all right. Um, our book has it in kilonewtons, so let's do that in kilonewtons. All right, so not too bad, five kilonewtons, 5.162 kilonewtons. <clears throat> so what I do with that is I go back to the book or the catalog, the manufacturer, whatever, but in our case, we're going to look at the book. Um, and we want table 11 too. Um, there's a couple of these tables. You have to be careful which one you're using. Um, there's another one over here. These are for different types of bearings. These are cylindrical. Well, you can't see it's off the top. Cylindrical bearings. Um, we want spherical you know ball bearings so we want this one there's actually two columns here that you might be interested in there's deep groove and angular contact um, those are describing um, the groove is talking about i don't know if you can even see down in there but these balls are riding in a kind of scooped out groove groove in this inner trace and there's one in the outer race also i called it a trace these are races inner race outer race um, and so that groove might be a deep groove. Angular contact uh, is describing a little more uh, articulation there. 
we're going to go with deep groove. Under deep groove, there is C10 and C0. So we just did C10. Um, so we're going to look, our number, wow, it's <laughs> over here scrolling. I had the inner key pressed down. Got to go back to the top. Um, we are at, let's see, 5.162 kilonewtons. So the very smallest one has a rating of 5.07. So that one is just under what we would be able to deal with um, because we need 5.162. So this 10 millimeter bore deep groove ball bearing would be basically too small to deal with our um, revolutions that we want, replacing five years and the load that we have to carry. Um, it would not work. But we go up to the next one, it says its C10 is C6.89. We only need 5.162. So the 12 millimeter bearing will work for bearing B. So let's write that down. So 12 millimeter bore, well, 12 millimeter bore will work for bearing B. Now, remember early on I mentioned that a lot of times you'd like for the same bearing to be used on both ends of the shaft. Um, and so now the job for us to figure out is will a 12 millimeter bore bearing work at A? Um, we don't think it will because A had you know, a higher load, plus it has to deal with the thrust load. Um, there was no accounting of a thrust load on B in here. So what we have to do when there's a thrust load present is we have to, the, the catalogs only, um, at least these catalogs only give us numbers for um, an, a radial load. So we have to figure out, okay, how do we calculate an equivalent load that kind of combines the thrust load and the radial load at A into this equivalent load that we can look in the chart with. Um, and you can't just uh, do the square root of the sum of the squares. You can't just do that. Um, so you have another diagram in your book on page 572. This little picture right here, what this is doing and this chart below it, table 11.1, those are going in and creating the equivalent load when you have a thrust load present. So um, let me draw this so that we can see it better. I think we're done with this page probably. Keep it out just in case we need it. So what that chart is telling us is this thing right here. And it has a line on it that looks like this. Let's draw it blue and then it takes off. And it's pulling out this parameter E. So this parameter E is what we're interesting in right, interested in right now. Um, what this chart is telling us, and it's got all these circles on it showing data points, but um, what it's telling us is that up until some point, the axial load, the thrust load that's being carried by bearing doesn't really make much difference. Um, so you basically just have no change in uh, that catalog rating that we were looking at. Um, so it, it's just too small of a thrust load to really matter, uh, and so you don't worry with it. Um, but at some point, this point E, now the, the axial load carried by the bearing does start to matter, and it starts increasing the equivalent force that we're trying to calculate. So. Um, we're going to assume that we are on the it does matter side. Um, we can figure that out in a second, but um, we're going to assume that we're on the side it does matter. There's a couple of parameters um, shown on the chart. Um, on this axis, it's the axial force or not, the thrust load, FA, over the uh, radial load, so the ratio of those two. And then in this denominator, there's also this term V. This term V um, is uh, one of two numbers. It's either one or I believe 1.2 is the other number for it. Um, so V equals one, 
well, we need to talk about what. All right. So remember, we have the inner race and the outer race. So um, when you install one of these bearings and it's in service, one of these races is rotating and the other one's held in place. And so it could be that um, the outer race is held in place and the inner one rotates, you know, and spins around, which is fine. Um, or it could be that the inner one stays still and the outer one spins. And you wouldn't think that really makes any difference at all, except that it actually does make a difference. So what happens is, let's just copy this little guy. Did a kind of bad job there. All right, so got all, got all crazy. Um, so when the outer race, let's say, stays still, so if the outer race is not moving, um, there is some kind of force. Remember, we just calculated an axial force. Let's just say that that axial force is pushing down on this thing and it's having to react over here. There's a zone, and I don't know exactly the dimensions of this zone, but let's just say it looks like this. There's a zone where um, this pressure is having to be reacted. And uh, if this outer race is stationary so i'm going to show it stationary kind of like it's you know attached to something over here then this little piece of that race is always in contact with one of these ball you know one of these ball bearings is always pushing on it so it, it never gets any relief basically it's always being pressed on um if we do it the other way maybe we can draw a better circle on, over here so inner race, outer race, there's a force, it gets reacted, and there's a zone, zone exactly the same, but now let's make the inner race the stationary one. So let's say that it's stationary now. Now that zone is right here. So well, you know, the balls are in here, so I guess maybe it's on the outer part of that. So it's right there. So now this little zone never gets any relief. This is the same force that has to be reacted, but now you've got a smaller area that never gets any relief from being pressed on. You know, this one's just constantly spinning around, so it's always getting different uh, loads on it. Uh, versus over here, you got a larger area. Same force, same zone, everything but a larger area to distribute that uh, force on um, that, that doesn't move. They can't both be locked. Obviously, that would make your bearing seize and defeats the purpose of it. They both can't be free because how do you even do that? Um, so one of them, inner or outer, has to be locked in place. Um, and this term V accounts for is it the inner one that's locked in place or the outer one locked in place? And the description is in, um, it's just in the text on page 573. And it says outer ring, uh, the factor of 1.2 for outer ring rotating. So 1.2 for outer ring, we, I think we called it the race rotating. And factor of one for inner ring rotating so when the inner ring is not rotating then that is a worse scenario right so you have a higher uh, V in there um, let's see what I used in mine I said inner ring rotating that's probably more normal um, it's not I guess standard but uh, that is what I chose so I we're in the V equals one the inner ring is rotating uh, scenario all right, now we've got our diagram all nice and cluttered up. How do we do any of this stuff? So let's go over to MathCAD and plug in some numbers. So V, that term we just spent five minutes talking about, is one. It doesn't have units, it's just one. Um, e is, and what I'm doing here is I'm reading uh, basically the um, x-axis, so F dot a um, f a is just I think we labeled it as that yeah we did it's just the axial load the thrust load that has to be carried 
remember our whole thing we're trying to do right now is translate this axial thrust load into an equivalent radial load uh, over V times um, the design load at A. So that's R A. So your book actually has it as, um, what does it have in there? F R. So the reaction force or the radial force. So I think it use, is using F A for axial thrust load and F R for radial load. Um, R A, the number that we calculated up here, is the radial load on bearing A. All right, so this will give us a value for E. 0.796, all right? So what we do with that number is we go back to the book and we look at this table, table 11.1. One, um, and we have values for E. There's no 0.796. It ends at 0.44. So there's a recommendation. You can see this little asterisk. Um, if it gets too small on the FA over C naught, we haven't done that yet. If it gets too small on that end, then you just, just keep using these numbers. Um, we're going to do a similar thing. In fact, if you look at Y2 over here, it kind of um, is at 1. You, can't, you couldn't really go below 1, really, and make, have it make any sense. And X2 is 0.56 in all the columns. These are well, What this is, is there's an equation right here, and it's... It's a piecewise equation where um, I guess they just didn't know another way to do it that made sense or whatever. But this equation is the equation of this line and then this line. And so what you see is the coefficients for um, y, the slope over here, uh, just they just zero it out for that half of the equation and make the coefficient for x, the slope on this side, or well, the uh, intercept. Um, they just make it equal to one. Well, no, it is a slope. Um, make it equal to one. So this part with all the ones and zeros is just defining this section of the graph. And this part with the uh, intercept and slope is defining this part of the graph. Um, so, and it doesn't change. It, it ends up at one. So since ours goes off the chart, we're just going to use these numbers. 0.56 for x and one for y in this equation. All right, let's write that in. So we have x, um, they have some subscripts, x2 uh, and y2, we'll use that. So x2 is 0 0.56, y2 is one. And what we can do at this point is, um, well, we also need, I didn't, I didn't calculate this part. We also need this part, FA over C naught. Um, FA is the axial force, the thrust load that we already have. C naught we get from the table. So we have to go and pick, this is an iterative process. We have to go and pick one of these bearings, and we know that bearing the 12 millimeter is too small, but um, that is the size that B ended up needing to be. So let's pick the C naught for B, which is 3.1 kilonewtons. So we're going to take C naught as 3.1 kilonewtons. Three 3.1 kilonewtons. Didn't want that. Kilonewtons. Um, and then for our um, FA, is, uh, well, we already have that defined. Let's just say it equal. There it is. So the ratio of these two. Zero point six seven. All right. So we already decided. Well, hopefully that made sense. Um, we already decided we're on this side of the graph. We decided we're over here um, because our 
um, E value was 0.7, whatever, um, and it went off the chart. So we're, we're over here somewhere. Um, FA, so the thrust load compared to the load rating at zero, so this is going to be a lower number than the C10 number. Um, our ratio was 0 0.67. So you can see it there on the screen, FA over C0. Um, C0 was over in our table 11 too. Um, now we find that number in here. So ours was 0 0.67. So there's a 0 0.7 and there's a 0 0.56. Um, you could go in and try to interpolate between the two, but it's probably better to just go ahead and take the smaller number That'll give us the larger um, uh, y coefficient in this equation. So it'll have a larger slope, basically, which will make a larger equivalent force. So that's going to be more conservative. Um, so let's just jump up to the 056 line and take x as 0.56. I, a minute ago, I wrote in x as, or y as 1. Um, we don't actually need that y. What we need is uh, we need to figure out after we've picked our bearing that we, you know, our candidate bearing, we need to figure out um, what the Y for that one is, which is 1.71. So let's go ahead and put that in 1.71. Um, all right. So our equivalent force. So this is coming from equation 11, 12. The equivalent force is that coefficient x. There's v again, so our v is not changed. It's still 1. Um, our radial force plus y, the coefficient we just got from the table 11, 1, and the axial load. All right, so let's type that in. So equivalent load x, uh, I called them x2. But I type c, x2 times v times F radial. Um, for us, F radial, we don't actually have FR. We have it labeled as, um, this is reaction at A. So that is the radial force at A. So we're going to call it RA. And then we add on the coefficient Y2 times, now we do have this one called FA. 500 newtons so what this is is this is the number that we're going to put in here in fact why don't we copy this whole equation um, now we're using a 12 millimeter bearing oh wait that's still c10 though <laughs> but it's at a um, and we're going to use this equivalent load and it gave us a C10 rating for the bearing at A of 18 kilonewtons, 70.953. We were trying to put a 12 millimeter bearing in there. So let's look at our book and see a 12 millimeter rating has a C10 value of 6.89. We need it to have 17.953. So that will nowhere near work. So 17.9, the first one that works is this 19.5, which is a 30 millimeter bearing. So now what you do is you iterate. So let's go back over to MathCAD. Um, we don't have to redo E. We, we know we're on the um, thrust load matter side of things, but we, we need to redo X2, Y2, um, and we need to redo C naught and the ratio of FA2. So we need to basically redo all this part and then calculate a new equivalent load and then calculate a new one of these. So we need to redo all of this. So I'm just going to copy it. Um, let's try, we were trying to try a 30 millimeter bore. So let's put the numbers in for 30. So C0 for a 30 is 10 kilonewtons. So I read that out of table 11, 2 for the C0 value, 10 kilonewtons. Um, FA did not change, that's the axial force that we uh, had before. 
these numbers now are going to change because we have a new FA to um, C0 ratio. In fact, let's put that in decimal. Oh, well. <laughs> kilonewton, kilonewtons. That doesn't make sense. There we go. 021. So now let's look at our chart. Actually, this one came out nice. Um, there is an 021, so we don't have to guess. We just use that line. So X again stays the same, but Y goes up to 2.15. All right. So I changed that. Y is 2.15 now. It recalculated an equivalent load. Um, and it's now at 591. It was at 500. Um, everything else in here stayed the same. Now I have a C10 rating of 21.23. We're at a 30 millimeter bearing as a C10 rating of 19.5. So it's, it's getting closer, but it's still not there yet. So let's go up to the next one, a 35 millimeter bore. All right. So let's actually, that should all still be copied. Try a 35 millimeter bore. So the C0 value for a 35 millimeter bore is 13.7. And X did not change. So here I am. 13.7 um, is the C0 value for a 35 millimeter bore. The thrust load didn't change. FA to C0 ratio did change. Um, so we're at 015 now. Um, in our book, 01, there's a 014. So again, we're going to do the same thing again, where since we're between two numbers, we're going to go with the smaller ratio, which makes Y at 2.3 now. We get a new value for our equivalent load plug that into our C10 rating and it comes out at 22.3 kilonewtons. We check that guy. We were at a 30, that was for a 35 millimeter bore. 35 has a C10 rating of 25.5. We only needed to have 22.3. So we finally found one. Uh, we started at 12 millimeters and ended up at a 35 millimeter bore for the bearing at A. Um, but we have one that will work. It will last the five years, 97% reliability. Um, and it looks like that one will work for us. So um, now you'd have the decision to make, well, do I make both of them 35 millimeters? That's a big jump. You know, the bearing at B only needed to be 12 millimeters. So I don't know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, in this case, they're so different that you probably actually keep them separate um, because not only do you have to um, on that bearing at B, if it suddenly has went from a 12 millimeter bore to a 35 millimeter bore, that means the shaft has to have grown also. So now you have a, a larger shaft, which means more rotating mass that you have to deal with. Um, although it does make the shaft stiffer, so maybe there's some good trade-offs. I don't know. Um, but in this case, since they're so far apart, you probably would have the bearing at A be a 35 millimeter and the bearing at B being the 12 millimeter. Um, but that part um, is iterative. There's not a, a way around that unless you just happen to, you know, get it right the first time. Maybe you guessed a better one. We, we didn't have to start at 12 millimeters. We knew that that would be too small. Um, well, I assume that uh, it would be too small. We didn't know that, but um, bearing B was uh, significantly underloaded compared to bearing A, so we figured it would be too small. Um, other than that, um, unless this E value puts you on the um, it doesn't matter side of the graph, graph, then um, you're probably going to be iterating a couple of times. That's why it's nice in MathCAD or, or Excel or something like that um, to not have to go resolve the uh, you know larger equation every time. Um, do be careful with this equation, particularly when you're uh, using these exponents, make sure you're applying the exponents to the right part. The one over B is only, you know, to this part. So make sure you're, you're doing your order of operations correctly, basically.
because uh, it's really easy to do them out of order and get a number here that might look right, but it's not at all right. Um, also, it's hard to track units through here uh, sometimes, so make sure, actually the only thing with units is XD, I guess, so um, everything else is unitless. So I guess that's not hard to keep track of, um, but do remember that these charts in your book only have metric units in them. Uh, so you do have to be careful with that. Um, any other things to remind you of? Uh, I don't think so. I think that those are the, the bits that you need to know other than remembering when you can use the simple 11-3 equation, equation 11-3 that does, uh, it only works for 90% um, reliability. Um, you can use that one. If you're given a situation where you have 90% reliability, you can use this equation. Um, otherwise, you need to use 11.10 over here. Okay, um, I think that will get us going for bearings. We'll do some more bearing topics um, and some journal topics, which are a type of bearing surface. And uh, we will do that later. See you all later.